Thanks very much, and uh, thanks to the organizers. Uh, and apologies, I actually changed my uh, title because I decided to mostly focus on one particular aspect, namely charge, but I'll talk a little bit about spin. Um, but I'll show you that I think what we can do with charge now in 2D materials uh, could be quite interesting for spins. And also just a very quick clarification, I'm actually at Boston College, not Boston University, uh, but that's uh, not a problem. In any event, so um, yeah, I'm gonna start by talking about ruthenium chloride, which has ruthenium atoms on the honeycomb lattice as an exfoliatable material. And as I'll show you is actually close to what's called the Kataev spin liquid. So the moments here are actually formed by unique combination of spin orbit coupling and um, uh, mod insulating state so that the moments are actually really a strong uh, J one half rather than spin one half state. And there's bond dependent exchange that leads to fractional excitations in the spins, which I'll show you a little bit how that comes about and uh, how we have evidence for that from Raman. I'll then rapidly switch to talking about how the unique uh, band structure of ruthenium chloride allows us to use it as a crystalline acceptor in the same way you would use an acceptor dopant. And therefore we can achieve modulation doping, namely uh, a doping remotely in a 2D material um, uh, from where the dopant layer is coming. So the way that that works is that ruthenium chloride has a very deep vacuum level. So here I'm showing you its wor the work function for a variety of 2D materials. And ruthenium chloride, uh, the vacuum level is 6 eV, roughly lined up with that of HBN, which I'll come back to in a minute. And the key point is it has a very narrow conduction band. So it can actually absorb uh, a large number of electrons. And if you compare that with monolayer or bilayer graphene, their work functions are roughly 4.6 eV. And so that means that you expect an enormous amount of charge transfer. Now, in the case of HBN, HBN, the valence band maximum is roughly lined up with a conduction band minimum of ruthenium chloride. And therefore one expects that it will not act as a, a strong barrier for the transfer of charge when ruthenium chloride is uh, placed next to it. And I will show you evidence that indeed uh, we can achieve doping through the HBN layer e, uh, for the monolayer graphene underneath. Um, we also have some preliminary data suggesting that this will work in tungsten selenide. And you may wonder whether this is something special about chlorine. In fact, it's not, despite chlorine's um, uh, very strong electronegativity, because if you compare that with chrome chloride, because chrome chloride has a work function of about 4.5 eV due to it being a very different kind of uh, semiconductor, um, you, we'll sh I'll show you evidence that this uh, doesn't work for chrome chloride. So if we really have this crystalline acceptor and it's, uh, uh, and it's really doing this modulation doping, a key question is how sharp are these uh, dopant interfaces and can we really prove this in a contactless method? So what we've done is create a variety of different heterostructures. I'm showing you a cartoon of one here. Um, in this case, we put monolayer graphene and we drape ruthenium chloride on top, but we put HBN over part of the structure. And then we use uh, Raman, in particular the G-peak, because it's well known that the G-peak position can uh, measure the, uh, uh, the doping level in the material. And I'll also show you that we have evidence that it's really doping and not strain. In any event, here is a map of that structure, the G-peak position. And what we find is that on the monolayer graphene, we get a G-peak shift that's a, a equivalent to roughly a 310 to the 13 or a Fermi level shift of about 600 MeV. And you'll notice that the shift, we still get a shift on uh, the HBN. So the dark blue layers is when the graphene is touching SiO2. In any event, even when the HBN is in between, we get a shift uh, roughly uh, 0.6, 10 to the 13, which is uh, due to the fact that the HBN is about five layers thick. So this shows that we can really achieve this uh, remote doping. And what's exciting is it can also happen with these very sharp interfaces. So you can see that basically we see the change in doping occur uh, at uh, essentially our resolution limit. Um, and there's also been some very recent work posted on the same day by Dimitri Basov's group, uh, group using near field techniques that shows this as well, which I'll show you briefly later. If I have time at the end, I hope to show you some uh, highlights of upcoming things we're doing. So in our group, we've developed what we call a clean room and a glove box. We can not only do exfoliation and transfer, we have Raman and AFM all inside inert atmosphere. And we also have the ability to do photolithography and deposition all within uh, side the system. So we can uh, fabricate on devices without, ever them, without them ever seeing oxygen. Uh, and this is also nice because you don't have to wear the bunny suit. In any event, we've recently added to the back of this a vacuum suitcase so we can now connect to a variety of different UHV systems, um, one of which is our low T Raman and transport system. So if you have an air sensitive material, 
that you'd like to measure without it ever seeing air, we can now achieve that. Last but not least, if I have time, I'll give you some evidence that this charge transfer depends on the relative twist angle between the graphene and the lithium chloride, which is something we're, of course, very excited to, to uh, explore. Okay, so I wanna just uh, jump in and explain what first got us uh, quite interested in ruthenium chloride. And that is that it is a potential model for what's called the Kataev spin liquid. So the Kataev spin liquid first uh, proposed by Kat Alexei Kataev in 2006, um, he had the idea that you would have a spin one half on the honeycomb lattice, similar to graphene. But here he artificially labels uh, the bonds. So you have your X, Y, and Z bond, which I've colored for you. Um, he then considered a model where you have a magnetic exchange, which is bond dependent. So what that means is the X component of the spin couples along the X bond, the Y component along the Y bond, and the Z component along the Z bond. And therefore these uh, interactions are highly frustrated and one would expect uh, not to have a long range magnetic order. But what he showed is that this model can be solved exactly and to do that, he took the uh, uh, magnons in the system and he fractionalizes them, he cuts them up, if you will, into uh, Majorana fermions. And what he showed is that there's two kinds of Majoranas that form. One is uh, free to move throughout the lattice and would behave like electrons in graphene. And the other is uh, attached to the bonds uh, and forms essentially the X, Y, and Z component of the spin. And so there was a lot of uh, interest in finding materials that could realize this. And it turns out that what you need is a combination of uh, Coulomb repulsion and spin orbit coupling to form what's called a relativistic mod insulator. So the question is, could you find evidence of this fractionalization? And we and many others looked at the Raman scattering because Raman can, uh, can observe, uh, as we heard earlier in the morning, um, the broad uh, excitations coming from this fractionalization. So this is now the Raman response plotted as a function of energy and temperature. And we, like many others, saw a broad continuum but after many years and careful measurement, we were able to show that this temperature and energy dependence was completely described by Fermi functions, not by Bose functions. And what that meant was that the excitations are really fermionic and not bosonic, consistent with fractionalization. Just to show that a little more convincingly, here are cuts uh, at different temperatures showing that indeed the Fermi function uh, describes the continuum temperature and energy dependence beautifully. So if you want to read more, please uh, look at our recent uh, quantum the Nature Quantum Materials paper. But of course, one of the key uh, uh, questions is what would happen to all of this when we exfoliate? And uh, what about heterostructures? Could we manipulate all of this and so on? And part of all of this was driven by my uh, excitement uh, in 2D magnets that of course, we now have a variety of ways to manipulate them and study them as we've been hearing, um, which could hopefully lead to new uh, phases of matter. Um, okay, so I'm gonna, uh, for the moment, basically stop talking about the magnetism in ruthenium chloride and just briefly explain uh, its unique electronic structure that allows that uh, bond dependent exchange. So what happens here is you have the D electrons are split by the crystal electric field into T2G and EG levels. You then have strong um, spin orbit coupling, which then further splits the T2G into a J effective one half and J effective three halves. So you've re dramatically reduced the, um, the uh, bandwidth. Um, what happens is you have five electrons and so they essentially fill up the three halves level and you've now half filled this J one half level such that even a very moderate on-site Coulomb repulsion will give you a mod insulator. And this is a unique mod insulator because it's really the combination of spin orbit coupling and um, Coulomb repulsion, which gives it to you. But nonetheless, the conduction band uh, and the band gap will be small and the conduction band will be very narrow. So um, our group and again, others uh, looked carefully at this electronic structure and really confirmed that this is indeed the case. One of the key things for applications is that if you look at the optical connectivity, you find that there is a one EV band gap and that it is a very insulating. Uh, you see no optical connectivity. And if you do resistance measurements, it's very difficult to measure below hundred Kelvin because you get giga ohms in the bulk crystal. Um, also because of the narrow bands, you find very little absorption in the visible. Okay, so the key point is that the work function, as I said earlier, is 6.1 EV, and the Fermi level is close to this conduction band, but again, this conduction band is very narrow. And this comes from the strong electronegativity of both ruthenium chlorine and this relativistic mod insulating state. So the key point is that if you, if you then compare that with model layer graphene, the graphene has a work function of 4.6 EV, and so you would expect an enormous amount of charge transfer going from graphene into ruthenium chloride. 
There's nothing special about monolayer graphene in that sense. Of course, bilayer graphene has roughly the same work function, but now you have a higher density of states. So even for the same change in Fermi level, you'll get many more carriers doped into the bilayer. Um, what's quite interesting is that the uh, valence band maximum of HBN almost lines up with this conduction band minimum. And so you might expect that you'd still be able to get a significant amount of charge transfer um, through to this ruthenium chloride due to this kind of resonant like tunneling. Uh, interestingly, it looks like this will work uh, for a variety of 2D materials, namely tungsten selenide has a work function in about the same as, as graphene, and therefore we expect to be able to uh, significantly hold dope it. Um, however, as I said, it's not just the chlorine. If you look at chrome chloride, you'll find that it also has a work function close to that of graphene. And so therefore you don't expect chrome chloride to have the same behavior as ruthenium chloride. Um, and to be able to perform this doping. So it's really something special about this density, uh, sorry, this band structure of ruthenium chloride. So why would you want uh, to be able to do this? Um, and I think we've heard already uh, quite a lot of presentations that in our 2D toolbox, we now have a, a rich variety of materials from semiconductors to magnets to ferroelectrics. But of course I'm at a, a academic institution so I can help but look for uh, donors and acceptors. And of course we know from MBE uh, that it's quite useful to have these uh, kind of materials, especially if they're in crystalline uh, single layer form. So um, again, why would you want such things? If we're thinking about nanoelectronics, we'd like to, of course, be able to locally uh, change the carrier density without having to apply gates. So to create, for example, PN junctions. If you're thinking about plasmonics, it's basically a similar story. You'd like to be able to nanoscale uh, form charge layers that you can then use for plasmonic applications. And of course, we've learned from MBE that if you want to create new phases of matter, it's quite useful to be able to control the doping and coupling to other layers remotely. So for example, it's now become possible to use barriers to separate yourself from a, a 2D uh, layer to a superconductor, but also similarly to control the coupling to the charge by putting the dopants remotely. And of course, that modulation doping was first invented and, and used in the observation of the fractional quantum ball effect. Now, what about the purpose of this conference? Um, of course, magnets are, this was also quite useful. So if you have some magnetic material, if you can strongly break inversion, say by this charge transfer, then you expect to get this kind of uh, uh, DMI interaction uh, that you could then make use of for things like skirmions as we heard yesterday. So of course the key question is if you have these donors and acceptors, are they clean and are they sharp? And uh, that's uh, kind of an open question that we wanted to solve with ruthenium chloride. So what I mean by that is there were a couple of groups who, who also similarly uh, uh, looked at this. Uh, first, I want to mention Eric Henriksen's group, who we've been collaborating with quite closely. So when Eric put ruthenium chloride on graphene, he found that the conductance was very high, uh, many uh, hundreds of uh, E squared over H. But nonetheless, when he gated it, he still saw a Dirac point, which is a point I'll come back to in a minute. There were theoretical calculations by Rosa Valenti's group and also by um, Una Kim's group that sh both showed using various kinds of DFT that indeed the conduction band of ruthenium chloride would be uh, about 600 MeV below the Dirac point. So you should expect large uh, doping and charge transfer from the graphene into the ruthenium chloride. And that was consistent with the um, carrier density levels that uh, Eric was getting from say Hall measurements where he would get roughly 310 to the 13. What was again, uh, uh, and, and sorry, I should say it wasn't just his group, there was also Klaus Kern's group who also showed that you could get uh, very high doping levels, in their case, 210 to the 13 uh, with ruthenium chloride graphene interfaces, and you could even see quantum oscillation suggesting the system was very clean. Um, however, uh, as I said, um, Eric found that there was this uh, Dirac uh, point showing up, which was quite confusing because it was close to zero gate voltage. And even in uh, Kern's uh, data, there is some suggestion that there may be multiple doping levels or in his inter interpretation, uh, that the spin orbit coupling of the ruthenium is splitting the Dirac point of the graphene. Um, and I would say that's still uh, unclear. So we wanted to find a method to explore this that was essentially contactless, would allow us to look at things like what is the, the sharpness and, and um, could we really measure just the graphene, et cetera. And so our group has been using Raman for many years um, so for example, we've been using it to explore magnetism in 2D materials. And we were uh, one of the, I think the first to show that you could see these magnetic excitations in chromium germanium telluride and use Raman as a way to measure the magnetism. If you're interested for more details, I'd point you to our 2D materials paper. Um, but for today, I wanna to focus on the graphene response. And it's well known that graphene has this G peak and 2D peak and the two peaks will shift 
when either you dope or strain the material. And then the utility of this is that they shift with different amounts, whether you're depending on whether you're uh, changing the Fermi level or you're changing strain. So for example, in this work from 2012, they showed that if you mapped a 2D material, uh, sorry, a graphene layer on silicon oxide, you would see a range of 2D and G peak values um, that were just following what you would expect for changes in strain. But if you annealed the sample, you would see all those values shift consistent with having changed the Fermi level. This was further confirmed by uh, recent work by um, uh, out of Urbana-Champaign from um, uh, Nadia Mason's group where they put graphene on these nanospheres where they could tune the size of the nanosphere to change the relative strain. And indeed they find that as the nanospheres get uh, smaller and smaller, you would see the shift in this uh, uh, G versus 2D uh, plot um, where it was consistent with having changed uh, just the strain and not the doping. And so we wanted to use this method as a way to check uh, what's happening when we put regime chloride and graphene together. Uh, and sorry, just to clarify, each one of these dots is a different uh, uh, point in your, in your map where you uh, measure the Raman um, G peak frequency and 2D frequency. Okay, so what did we actually see? So here I'm showing you from uh, the results from a graphene piece that was on top of both ruthenium chloride and SiO2. And in the regions where we're on top of SiO2, we see that uh, the G-peak and 2D-peak are consistent with being close to charge neutrality. However, when it's uh, sitting on top of ruthenium chloride, we see a large shift primarily in the G-peak frequency consistent with having dramatically changed the Fermi level. And in fact, the value that we get is roughly uh, 600 MeV or if you want three, 10 to the 13 um, carriers. So we wanted to check that we knew what we were doing and we weren't screwing this up. So we tried to control. So we uh, put uh, made a similar structure with chrome chloride. And what we found is similarly, uh, well, sorry, is diff quite differently that indeed the chrome chloride shifts mostly along the strain axis and not at all, at all along the doping axis. And this was uh, really consistent with what we expected given the work function of chrome chloride. Um, now, it's not just a one device, we've made many heterostructures, but what's interesting, as you see from this uh, orange heterostructure, is some of them uh, shift by amounts that are uh, varied by more on average than the range of dopings you would get in a given device. In other words, some devices seem to say be doped at 2, 10 to the 13, some 2 and a half, 10 to the 13, times 3, etc. And as I'll show you later, if I have time, we believe this is because we haven't controlled the relative twist angle between the two and that that is controlling the uh, amount of charge transfer. Okay, so um, again, all of the structures we're measuring are done without having to do any fabrication. And so the question is, you know, how clean and sharp are these? So here is that uh, structure I mentioned to you earlier where we placed graphene on top of ruthenium chloride and also SiO2. But here we intentionally placed the graphene on both a single layer and bilayer of ruthenium chloride with the question, how, uh, how much ruthenium chloride do you need to get the effect? So here is the G-peak uh, map. So the first thing you notice is that you can actually see the border between SiO2 and where the ruthenium chloride is uh, in the map, and it looks very sharp. I'll come back to that later. However, you can't obviously tell where the two layer and one layer ruthenium chloride is. And so let me draw that for you now. And what we found is indeed that the average doping level in the one layer and two layers is essentially the same. So it looks like more or less one layer ruthenium chloride is enough to do all the work. We then wanted to see what about the other side. So we made a thick ruthenium chloride and we put down a monolayer and bilayer graphene on top of it. And we imaged it again. And indeed we find the interfaces are all very sharp. And in the monolayer, we get about 310 to the 13 with, as I said, a Fermi level shift of about 600 MeV. Now the bilayer looks like it's actually shifted less. That's slightly misleading. It's because it has a higher density of states. Uh, so there's actually a, low, uh, a smaller shift. It, it, roughly, you get less shift in the GP for the same shift in Fermi level. Long story short, what we find is in the bilayer case, we get a doping of roughly twice as much as we got in monolayer graphene. And again, we believe that's because of the higher density of states in the bilayer. So this was quite exciting, and it really suggested that we can do this sort of atomic-like uh, charge transfer in these 2D materials. And the question is, are we really doing modulation doping? So in other words, are we really uh, sort of having dopants in one layer and the carriers in a different layer? Um, and so just to drive the point home, we tried uh, making a structure where we now have uh, monolayer graphene on the bottom. We put HBN over part of it, and then we drape the ruthenium chloride over both. So what you see is that uh, in this GPEAK uh, map is that in the monolayer graphene region, in this case, we got about 210 to the 13. However, when we switch to the HBN layer, 
being in between, we get about 0 0.6, 10 to the 13. And this is with actually five layers of HBM. It's actually fairly thick. And what the DFT suggests is that if we were to go to a single layer of HBN, we could achieve almost uh, the same doping as the two materials touching directly. And, um, and last but not least, we wanted to again check how sharp are these interfaces, not just in the vertical, but in the horizontal direction. So we took cuts to the GPEAK maps. And in all three of the devices I presented, you see that we see uh, 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 basically within our resolution, which is 300 nanometers, a very rapid a change in the GP consistent with essentially the doping ending at the border. Um, now, what about that uh, Dirac minimum I mentioned earlier in the transport and, and about homogeneity? So one thing we noticed when we looked at our spectra is at certain points, we would find basically a nice sharp GP consistent with this uh, highly shifted uh, value. In other parts of the spectra, we would see both the shifted value and a GP consistent with a totally undoped graphene layer. And if we looked at yet further other places, we would see basically equal weights of the two. In other words, we had just as much unshifted as shifted. And so our interpretation of this is that within our spot size, which is uh, roughly um, uh, a micron, but in reality, we have a resolution of about 300 nanometers, uh, as I showed you earlier, that within that we have very uh, small regions where the two materials are not touching and therefore the graphene is undoped. And this is, would be again, consistent with this doping being very uh, short ranged. So what we could do is then use these two um, uh, peaks as a, as a measure of the homogeneity. So for example, in a, in a, in a spot where we have 100% of the weight in um, the shifted G peak, we would call that 100% homogeneous. And in a spot where we had equal weight, we would call it 0% homogeneous. And so then we could go and map what was the homogeneity like. So what we found is when we had monolayer graphene and monolayer lithium chloride on SO2, then in fact, the result was quite inhomogeneous. Um, which is not uh, surprising given the roughness of the SO2. However, even when you go to just two layers of ruthenium chloride where you would expect it to be flatter, indeed we find more uniformity, although not uh, totally homogeneous uh, doping. And it, the, uh, what we believe is happening is that when you do transport, of course, you average over both the doped and undoped regions. And so that's why you can see a direct point minimum in the, in the transport, as I'll show you in a second. So again, we tried this with HBN because as we all know, HBN is the wonder material that uh, makes everything nice and flat and homogeneous. And indeed what we found was that in, uh, in the regions where we had uh, the HBN space there, we find highly homogeneous uh, regions of, of the doped graphene. Um, now what's also interesting is again, here I'm showing the, the conductance uh, versus gate. And again, you see that Dirac point minimum very close to zero. And again, we believe that's coming from these undoped regions that weren't touching. And we checked that if we gated our devices, um, then uh, that we, the shifted G peak would not move at all uh, because of our basically our resolution and charge given the amount of doping we could achieve at a gate. Um, and so then what we did was we looked at a device where the Raman, uh, or sorry, we, we tried to look for these new generations of devices, which the Raman suggested was highly homogeneous. And indeed what we found is that uh, the gate is now consistent with no direct point uh, being there as if you have none of these neutral regions. Um, what was very exciting was to see the results also from Dmitry Baslov's group where they made similar heterostructures and using near field could see a variety of different kind of uh, plasmon resonances, including edge plasmons um, due to this very sharp interfaces that you get uh, and bulk plasmons. And from their bulk plasmons, they get doping levels consistent with what we see. That's this number two in the image on the right. Um, however, you see this uh, 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 number three, which is uh, a sort of a defect that they find. And what they found was that they could explain that um, due to, again, a very small sort of tandem nanometer size uh, region, which is totally undoped, uh, which is again, consistent with what we find for the homogeneity response in the Roman. Um, so uh, just in my remaining few minutes, I wanna highlight some other things going on in my, in my group. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we've built up this so-called clean room in a glove box, which is now uh, uh, detailed fully in our recent uh, review of scientific instruments, where we can do 2D transfer, Raman mapping, photocurrent mapping, um, um, and transport at room temperature, all in argon, as well as AFM. And then we can transfer over to the left side where we can spin coat and do mass lithography and deposition to make contacts. And as I said earlier, we've recently added to the back of this a vacuum suitcase, so the ability to bring materials in and out through UHV. Uh, and so what we can do is take this suitcase and take a device that we say, or material we freshly cleave, uh, and then bring it to our low temperature optics and transport uh, cryostat uh, 
uh, to, for, for um, measurement. Um, and just to show you how that works, this is a cut uh, or a view from the top if we take the top off, where we're transferring in a device with up to 15 contacts with our uh, uh, microscope objective inside. Um, we could, of course, also couple this to MBE, so we can now take uh, thin films with a nice clean surface and then make 2D heterostructures on top of them. And, in, and, and we have not done this yet, but in principle, one could then couple this to a variety of other surface sensitive techniques, which we're quite excited to try. And this has led to a number of uh, publications with uh, various collaborators, including, as I mentioned, our recent RSI. I wanna highlight one of them, which was, I think, of interest to this community, uh, uh, which is a work done with Leslie Shoup's group at Princeton. So we worked on GDT3, which she found is a, a very high mobility antiferromagnetic uh, metal, um, which can be exfoliated. However, it's extremely air sensitive. So this is the Raman response we got when we uh, cleave the GDT3 and uh, immediately uh, pumped it out. And I will mention that we got the same response for uh, flakes where we uh, tried to encapsulate with HBN. In any event, what you see is this um, a large series of peaks that are just coming from the tellurium oxide on the surface. However, if we cleave the crystal in our glove box and then UHV uh, transfer it over to the cryostat, we find that all of those oxide peaks are gone and we can uh, better study the intrinsic response. So um, returning to ruthenium chloride, one of the uh, things we wanted to try is, can this only work for 2D materials? So we uh, worked with Jagadish Madera's group who grew europium sulfide on top of the ruthenium chloride by MBE. And we were quite interested to try this because it has a, a, a work function of 3.3 EV, quite low, a bit lower than the ruthenium chloride. Um, and indeed it's a nice, uh, uh, europium sulfide itself is a nice semiconductor, magnetic semiconductor. And if you look at the bulk, it has a resistance of about two, 10 to the minus two ohm centimeters. However, what we found is for our thin films, the europium sulfide, when it's grown on ruthenium chloride, uh, has a four order reduction magnitude, uh, sorry, four order reduction in the, um, four orders of magnitude reduction in the resistance, uh, consistent with being heavily doped. We also tried this with tungsten selenide. There we wanted to, again, try this contactless method using PL. Um, where it's well known that the exciton uh, peak will shift strongly when you go from say N-type to P-type, um, as shown by this work done where they, uh, uh, they uh, switched uh, the doping by a ferroelectric layer underneath. So we took CVD tungsten selenide uh, grown by uh, Young He Lee's group and we just placed ruthenium chloride on top and we did a, a imaging of the PL. And indeed we find that when we measure PL on just the CVD tungsten selenide, we get uh, roughly the uh, intrinsic value. And when it's on ruthenium chloride, it seems to shift consistent with being p-doped. I would say this is very preliminary and we're now trying to work harder to, to really confirm that this is actually a, a charge transfer effect. Um, so last but not least, I just wanna end with a kind of a exciting uh, possibility. So one thing uh, that when Kim's group noticed uh, was that when they do their calculations for DFT, they could do them uh, by placing the graphene um, at different relative angles to ruthenium chloride. And um, what they noticed was that the carbon overlap with the ruthenium uh, depended on this angle. So for example, when they do it uh, well aligned, as I'm showing you here, they get a charge transfer level consistent with what we see in some of our best devices. However, when it's twisted by 30 degrees, the overlap is far reduced. And the result of which is they get a, a lower doping level. And that's again, consistent with these lower doping levels that we see. So we believe that the twist angle is also uh, crucial here in this charge transfer effect. So I just want to uh, acknowledge the various funding agencies that have contributed to our work over the, over the years, and also say we're more than ex uh, happy to collaborate with others on either this material or other capabilities that we have. And we're also looking for a postdoc. Um, I want to thank especially Yiping Wong, a graduate student in my group, and Jesse Bagley in Eric Hendrickson's group, who did uh, all the work I've shown you today on ruthenium chloride, um, samples from Dave Mandris, and of course, the usual uh, Japanese uh, group. Um, lots of theory help from Eli uh, Gerber in Una Kim's group in Cornell. And, uh, and uh, also, I want to highlight Mason Gray, a, a fantastic graduate student of mine who built up that glove box I showed you. So just to summarize, I hope I've convinced you ruthenium chloride is quite an exciting material to work, not only because of its um, unique magnetic interactions, but also because it has this uh, relativistic mod insulating band structure that looks like it will absorb a lot of charge from other 2D materials and therefore act like a 2D acceptor. And uh, that from our Raman, we find that it is indeed can be very clean and very sharp uh, dopant as you would expect from 
uh, modulation doping. And sorry, I forgot to mention earlier that in our cleanest samples, air exceeds mobilities of about 5,000, which as far as we can tell is the largest mobility that one has ever gotten um, at this doping level in graphene. So with that, I will uh, thank you for your attention and gladly take any questions.